Okay, so since we're starting to SQL, the topics are going to be as follows for today. Um, intro to SQL, which is basically I'm going to give you some background. Well, I'm going to talk about something called DDL, which is uh, well, after I talk about how SQL is broken down, it'll make that what the DDL stands for makes more sense, but that stands for Data Definition Language. Uh, I'm going to cover insert, update, and delete statements, and then I'm going to do the most basic select statement. I've done this topic two different ways where I've done all the slides and then did a demo at the end. I've done it where the demo was interrupting the slides. And I've learned that the demo all together at the end that covers everything I covered today seems to be better because then people will go to the recording and just jump to the spot where I'm doing the demo instead of having to jump through the slides over and over and over again and not knowing where exactly things are. So it's let, I'll get the, the flapping out of the way and then I'll do a demo at the end. Okay. Now. Wall of text slide number one. There's always important to have history so you know where things came from. SQL is what they call a special purpose programming language. It's designed to do one thing. Java, which you guys are learning, or if you know other languages such as PHP or Python, those are known as general purpose languages. A general purpose language means you can do all kinds of things with it. A special purpose language is designed to do one thing and do it well. Doesn't mean it's a nice language, but it means it's going to do it well. Uh, another example of a special purpose language is anybody here ever study stats? Anybody, anybody ever use Mathematica? Ever you learn a language called R? R. R. Yeah, R can be used machine learning, but it's actually used specifically for statistics. It's a stats language. It's a, it's a, a programming language made just for statistics which is kind of cool. Um, so SQL is a special purpose language. It was created by IBM. There's a, you know, a company that everybody's heard of. In the early 1970s, SQL has been around for a while. It's been around since before me. Not by much, but enough. Um, it was originally called SQL, which stood for Structured English Query Language. Thus, the pronu stupid pronunciation that consists to this, can persist to this day, such as SQL as SQL. They had to change to SQL because they were about to get sued. Somebody was going to take IBM to court and win. So IBM said, back up the truck, we're just going to call it something else. Um, by the way, SQL is not pronounced SQL. It's SQL, just so you know. Like I said, it's, a, it's leftovers from way back in the day, and people, it carries forward today. SQL is what they call an initialism, not an acronym. An acronym you pronounce, an initialism, you say the letters, like IBM, SQL. Can you imagine, instead of calling it IBM, you called it IBM? <laughs> there, see? Um, the first commercial version, surprisingly, it didn't come from IBM. It came from Oracle. Oracle version 2, which ran on a computer called the VAX. Most resilient computer known to man. You could not kill this thing, even if you tried. And I just, it, I'm not kidding. Uh, it was actually known for percussive maintenance. As in, you took a hammer to it every once in a while to actually get it to start cooperating again. It was an amazing machine. Um, it was made by a company that had roots here in Ottawa, uh, digital equipment. Most of you probably don't even know about that company anymore, but they were around for a while before Compaq bought them. That's before HP bought Compaq. Just going back. Um, they decided a standard needed to be established. The first uh, standard was established in 1986. So at that point, it became standardized, as in a body got together, said we need a certain amount of features. This is the features that everybody who implements SQL should have. In 1986, there was a grand total of three people making SQL databases. Oracle, IBM, and the University of Waterloo. The 1999 standard is considered the most generally adopted standard. I had massive changes that were brought along for the ride, um, including rules for what triggers should be, recursion, and if you don't know what recursion is, you got to look it up 
because you can't understand recursion unless you understand recursion. That's just how it is. Uh, regular expressions, although nobody actually put them in place for years after. It's like everything else where, you know, the body, is standards body, say, you must have these features to be considered to this standard level. And then everybody says, yeah, we're going to do our own thing for another f 10 years. Um, they had, there's a standard in 2003, 2006, 2008, and they just kept adding stuff that nobody uses. Um, they actually, in 2008, they finally brought in the standard for the command called truncate, which everybody had already uh, because it's a useful command to have. Uh, truncate allows you to empty out a table instantly, um, very quickly. Uh, last time I checked is at 2011, but I think there was a draft for a more recent version. But last I heard, there's still a 2000 level, 11. Um, most database servers do 99. Um, with a little bit of stuff added in from the newer standards. They're, they're, each of the manufacturers that make, the software developers make their databases, pick cherry pick the feature set that they want. So most of the time it's like saying, well, we're up to this standard Mostly, so that's just like a, a measuring stick of, you know, who's got the most features. And s like, for example, like I said, in 2003, they added XML. Almost nobody's using XML anymore. Everybody's moved on to using JSON. So they're adding features and people aren't even rolling them out. Um, but the SQL you're going to learn in this course, um, the, the 1986 standard covers like half of it. Um, it'll be slightly newer than the stuff I was learning in 96. So a little bit newer. Which, by the way, I was learning on Oracle 7. So if you want to put a timeline on things. Um, all right. Now that's enough of the history lesson. SQL is a strange language in the sense of most people that are used to program languages aren't used to having a program language divided into three separate chunks. Java is Java is Java no matter which way you cut it. C and C++ is C and C++ no matter how you cut it. The language is whole onto itself and then there's libraries. SQL, they decided to break it down into three separate chunks. There's the data definition language. The DDL is to create and maintain objects. That's the construction crew that builds your house. The data manipulation language, also known as DML. By the way, we're going to spend an awful lot of time on DML. DDL will be done as of today. DML will be the next three weeks, just so you have an idea of the scope here. Uh, that's the one that puts up the paint and decorates your house. And then the DCL, data control language. We are not going to touch that at all. And that's for security. Uh, there's a few reasons I don't cover it. One, since you guys are in CP, you're going to learn it later. That's number one. So why waste my time on it? Two, even though most of the commands are fairly standard, every database server does it differently. So there's no point teaching you how to do it in Postgres if you end up working with SQL Server where it's completely different. So as long as you know it's out there, uh, you're not even going to get tested on it. Um, li the language itself is case insensitive. Object names and data can be case sensitive. So the language, the portions, the keywords of the language itself are not case sensitive. So it doesn't make a difference if you write the word select, uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, camel case, write it like you had a seizure. It's all good. It doesn't care. However, depending on the database server, the object names, such as your tables and your fields and your views, may or may not be case sensitive. They are case sensitive in Postgres. They're case sensitive in Ingress. Uh, they are not case sensitive in IBM DB2 uh, because IBM DB2 doesn't let you create anything other than uppercase. How can it be case sensitive if it doesn't let you do it any other way? Oracle lies. Because uh, it pretends to be not case sensitive, but it is. It just gets fancy. Uh, MySQL is very case insensitive, but that's also like the the dumb cousin who accepts everything you say. So that's MySQL. And there's and Microsoft SQL Server depends on what code page you installed it on. 
So for example, you install it on a language that has a mixed case, such as English, it's not case sensitive. You install it in another place where the code page is different, even though it looks like it's still a Latinate language, it will be case sensitive. Or you install it in a language that doesn't have mixed case, such as Cyrillic. Everything's uppercase. So you just got to be careful with the things. That's why, remember, I was talking about my naming conventions that everything is lowercase, because even when it's lowercase, the ones that lie will still accept it. So it's just easier that way. Um, it uses spaces as keyword delimiters. Again, when I go back to my naming conventions, when I talk about don't use spaces, use underscores. Because it uses spaces to separate the keywords in an SQL statement. So you write your command, it puts in spaces. You put in spaces, otherwise it doesn't know what's happening. The good news is, this one you don't have to relearn. The command terminator is a semicolon. So at the end of the command, you put in a semicolon, yay. Now what's really odd about the SQL language is if there's only one command, you don't need the semicolon. It hits the end, it says, oh, it's the end, good enough. Oh, they didn't give a semicolon, I don't care. But if you have two SQL statements, you have to separate them using semicolons. So just like in C, for the most part. All right, the DDL, which is going to be the first major focus today, is made up of three commands. Create, alter, and drop. Create allows you to build stuff. Alter lets you change it. Drop lets you get rid of it. So you create something new. You modify it by altering it. And then you just drop it. We don't want to play with it anymore. Just like a hot potato. I, was gonna, I used to use another example, but apparently people got offended. Okay. So... I have posted a link, it's an older link, but the syntax hasn't changed. Links at the bottom. I don't go in detail as to the syntax. I give you guys a basic example. Because just even the create table command, the Postgres page, if you were to print it, it would be about 12 pages long of all the different parameters you can feed it. So I'd rather give you guys the basics, and if you need something more than the basics, you can go and look it up. But essentially, the syntax that follows, create, because you're creating, right? So the first word is create. Then you tell it what. Are you creating a table? Are you creating an index? Are you creating a view, a function, a trigger? Whatever it is you create, you tell it what is created next. Then you give it a name. Like any sane language, your objects must be named. This is your table name. So we know when you're doing your assignment, you create a, a table called menu items. It'd be create table menu items. And then I have this thing, definition. The problem is, this is where I don't cover the, the create statement in detail because I could spend an entire lecture just on create. The definition changes depending on what kind of object you're creating. Thus, you might as well go look how to do it, depending on what you're trying to create. I will create views later and stuff like that. It's not a, an issue. Um, Creating a view is different than creating a table. Creating an index is different than creating a table. Just like when you build a house, you don't build a house the same way you'd build a car. They serve different jobs. Therefore, they're not built the same way. The, the instructions are different. Now, I have an example here. Create table test. Now, you'll notice that there's brackets. And inside the brackets, it's a list of fields. And the fields usually come in the format of the field name, space, the data type, space maybe, anything that modifies that field. As in, is it a primary key? Is it not null? Is there a default value? As you can see, I put in all three versions there. So the first one's ID big serial. That should look familiar because we did that in the designs. Then it's a primary key. That's actually going to create it as a unique index. It's going to create an index. And it's going to be set as the primary key. The second one's name. It's a varchar 50. Again, we've seen that. It's set to not null. That means it cannot be empty. Just like when you hit that little not null checkbox that some of you seem to be so fond on hitting on every field. Not null. Last one's active. It's a bool. Again, set to not null, but it defaults to true. Now, when you read this, it's fairly English. It's not very like Java where you got, you know, some pretty odd syntax. 
or even in PHP or Python where the syntax gets really creative depending on what you're trying to do. SQL is very English, as in there's not a lot of special characters happening in here. There's what, a couple of brackets and a comma and a semicolon. That's all you're going to see in there. I'll, dis I'll demonstrate how to do the alter when I do the demo. But the command called alter is what you use to modify the, the definition of the object. So if you want to add a column, rename a column, drop a column, uh, change the, in the rules of the index, stuff like that. Depending on per object, the syntax changes dramatically. Yes. Yeah, you'd go alter test table s alter table test. Okay. Then you go add column, give it a column data type, default blah blah blah, drop column blah 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 blah. But if you're doing an index or a view, you could be doing alter view, alter index, alter function. There's all kinds of things. Depending on what happens after you've given it the name, the syntax changes dramatically depending on what the object is. So, um, yeah, when I went to school, we actually had an entire term dedicated to SQL, and we spent like three days on just the DDL commands. Honestly, we did. That was a waste of time. <laughs> we they could have covered it in one class and told us if you don't know how to do something, look it up. Here's the book because well, we didn't have internet. Which you guys have internet, so. Um, all right, drop. Drop is the easiest one to remember. It's pretty much the same for absolutely everything. Drop, what's it called? Goodbye. There's nothing after the name of the object. There is one command you can add on there which is really, really dangerous. It's called cascade. Uh, if you have a table that has child children, so let's say I've got a customer's table and it has an orders table and the orders have an order lines table, and I go drop customers cascade, it just deletes all the things that are related to it. It wipes out the entire family tree in one go. Um, it's a very dangerous command to run when you use cascade and you don't use it unless you know what you're doing. And that's why I don't cover it written down in the slides because until you start learning how to deal with it, you shouldn't play with it. Um, Sort of like telling a little five-year-old, don't run around with, your, with that really sharp knife. Because it can be stabby. Um, so, like I said, in the demo, I'll go through each of these commands. I'll give you guys an example of each one and show you guys how it behaves and what it does. Um, the next one I'm going to cover, so like I said, I'll get rid of the slides first, is the DML. It's made up of four, kind of five commands, depending on who you ask. Now, the first one is insert. This is not the same thing as create. Create builds a container. Insert puts something inside the container. So if you want a picture, I want you to add data to my database, it's a picture of somebody inserting a piece of paper in a, in a file, in a file folder. You got a file folder? You insert a piece of paper in the file folder? That's where they got the word insert from. And when you think about it, it makes sense because you're adding something into the existing box. Update. You're changing the data. Delete. You're going to get rid of the data. Don't get confused with drop. Delete. Deletes what you asked it to. Drop deletes the whole thing. Big difference. Well, okay, let's picture this way. You got a you got a house, you got nice furniture inside of it. It's all nicely decorated and you decide you don't like your couch, so you're going to drop your house. <laughs> New house. Right? Whereas the other one, you're going to get some guy to carry the couch up to the curb. Yeah. The like lead is to delete the data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, select allows you to see the data. And today I'll cover the very most basic select statement. And then there's truncate. Truncate is like delete. But like I say on here, if delete's a pellet gun, truncate's a Gatling gun. Um, delete works row by row. So if you have a million rows in your database, it'll go delete row one, delete row two, delete row three, a million times. Truncate goes top of the table. There's nothing else here. A deleting a million rows may take 30, 40 seconds. A truncate usually takes about 100, 100 milliseconds. You don't get to say oops. 
uh, it's a very dangerous command, and I rarely use it. It's only it's only used specifically when I'm I'm uh, using cache data where I'm clearing my cache and then I repopulate my cache. Uh, you don't truncate unless you absolutely have to. And again, every command has completely different syntax. And this is where I, I have my little rant about the IBM designers who decided to design this language. I'm 90% sure that they got four pocket protector types set in four separate rooms say, each of you are responsible for this piece of the language and you're not allowed to talk to each other. Because the insert looks completely different from the update, completely different from the delete. The delete sort of looks like the select, so I'm guessing that the delete and the select guy went and had coffee together and kind of agreed how they should look. But the other guys weren't talking to each other, so you know, they didn't want to soil their pocket protectors with the other guys' pocket protectors. I have no idea. And on the other hand, truncate looks just like drop. You go truncate table name, gone. Um, All right, insert is how you add data. Yes. Truncate and drop. Drop, you have a house, drop erases your house. Truncate convinces you that there's nothing inside your house and your house is empty and you get to start all over again. The structure stays there, but there's nothing inside. So for example, drop destroys your house. It's like it was never there. It's like a tornado. Truncate convinces you that there's nothing there. But while you're convinced that there's nothing there, there's some magic goblins that are slowly deleting, getting rid of everything inside your house. So it's not there. So you can start, every time you go add a new piece of furniture, the other piece of furniture that was there is magically gone. So if anybody here knows how delete works on file systems like DOS, like the old DOS, You'll know exactly what I'm talking about, where they just convince you that the space is now available. Delete, on the other hand, is you're standing outside and you've got a crew of guys going in carrying out the furniture one, at a, one piece at a time in front of you. So that's the difference between delete, truncate, and drop. Truncate leaves the structure standing, but it's empty. Delete empties out the structure piece by piece. Drop just flattens the structure. Yes? It, it basically tells the table there's nothing there. It, it does a Jedi mind trick. It deletes a table of contents. So, for example, when you delete a file under Windows, all it does, it Windows says this space is now available. The data is still there. This space is still, it just, it tells, Windows tells it the space is now available. Truncate does the same thing. It just says, you see this five gigabytes worth of data on the disk? That's free, use it whatever way you want. It's like there's nothing there. And database servers work so fast that once it's gone, it's gone. It's probably already been overridden. So you can't even recover the data if you made a mistake. So actually, which leads me to another important statement before I continue. Remember this, there is no one do. It's like the most important thing about the SQL language except for Oracle. And even setting this up on Oracle is really, really painful. Unless you're using transactions, which I don't talk about till the end of the term, there is no such thing as undo. You delete something, it's gone. You add something, it's there. Those of you that have already started working on some labs and saying, it's giving me an error that this already exists. I wonder why. Because you already did it. You didn't undo it, it's still there. Changes are permanent and instant. So mistakes do have ramifications. I have stories about instant regret and matching ramifications. Um, but that's for a different time. So the first command is insert. You can't change, delete data, or even select it unless you've put it in in the first place. And the syntax you see here, the example, you'll see there's two lines. There's the syntax, and then there's the actual command. You'll see angle bars. And the example, that's me saying, put something here. That doesn't need the angle bars. Just, just saying, when you see those angle bars in one of my examples, that says, put something here. So insert into table, whatever the table happens to be called. Don't include the angle bars. Just insert into table. The list of columns you want to insert, you can insert into a single column. You can insert in three or four columns. Uh, you can insert into every column if you want. <coughs> 
And then you have values and a list of values. The list of values has to match the list of columns. If you insert into three columns, you have to have three values. Otherwise, you get an error, which I will try to remember to demonstrate for you guys so you know what those errors looks like. It's important to know what the errors mean. So the following is an example. Insert into test the table that was created earlier. I'm going to fill in name and active with the values woohoo and true. Now, there are some things you have to be careful when you insert. Strings are quoted. Why? Because you quote strings. And by the way, universally, single quote marks are considered the quote mark. Some database servers allow double quotes. Postgres will hate you if you use double quotes. It's a stickler for standards. It happens to use the double quotes as its identifier, as in anything inside double quotes is the name of an object, not value. Single quotes. Numbers are not quoted. So whether it's a float, an injure, whatever, it's not quoted. Numbers are not quoted, and neither are booleans. You'll see right there the value true does not have quotes around it. Why? Because you're inserting true, not the string called true. You're inserting true. And Postgres is very forgiving. It allows you to actually quote it, and it'll accept it quoted because it assumes you're being stupid and that you meant it to not be quoted. It'll also accept 0 and 1. It'll also accept T and F for true and false. That's just what it does. Postgres is forgiving when you feed it data. It's not forgiving in the syntax. The update statement. Now, let's use change the data. As you can see, there's the uh, example. Update test, set name equal to working, where ID is equal to 1. Now. It's very important once you learn a little bit later about the WHERE clause. Because um, if you do this without the WHERE clause, it'll affect everything in the table. The WHERE clause is used to filter down to the minimum number of records you want to modify. We'll be covering WHERE in detail next week. Just let it be said that if you do an update statement without a WHERE clause, it's going to affect the entirety of the table you're modifying. And it's not going to ask, are you sure you want to do this? You know when you go to Windows and you go delete, select all, delete, and it goes, are you sure you want to do this? The database server doesn't care. It assumes you know what you're doing. Yes? Uh, let's say, yeah, if the table test had three or four columns, and one of the columns is called name, Every single row's value in the name field would become working. It, if you don't specify what to modify, it modifies everything. It's not the other way around where you know a lot of software, if you don't specify, it tells you, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Or, hey, you didn't tell me what you want me to do, so I'm not going to do it. This one goes, ha. <laughs> I'm just going to do it, literally. It's, we all have that person we know, right, where you tell them, can you go get me a drink? And they come back with something random because he didn't specify what you want. You know, the guy wanted a drink. He comes back with like three day old water has been sitting in his car instead of getting you a fresh bottle from like 10 feet further away. Because the, he just assumed, you know, he said, give me something to drink. He doesn't care what he wants to drink. Let's give him something old nasty. SQL is like that. If you don't tell it what you want to modify, it modifies everything. It assumes you know what you're doing. So this is where the SQL language is dangerous because it assumes you actually are a competent operator. And if you've never done it before, you're not a competent operator. So got to be careful. Delete. Again, looks a lot like the, the update statement, kind of. Oh, yeah, actually, I want to go back to the update statement so I can specify a few things here. Update test, set name equal to working, where ID is equal to 1. If I want to modify the true at the uh, active field at the same time it'd be update test set name equal to work in comma active equals false so you have to specify the key value pairs so there is key value syntax in other words the key being the field name the value being whatever's after the equal sign and if you want to do more than one you separate them up with a comma I'll do an example when I when I do the demo all right delete from table Again, I show that the WHERE clause is optional. 
Don't ever do a delete without a where clause, unless you really want to get rid of everything. Again, because again, it's going to assume you know what you're doing, and it's just going to do it. And it's going to go all the way, and it's still faster than you are. So unless you're dealing with tens of millions of rows, there's no way you can hit the stop button fast enough to stop it from. Well, once you've realized you've made a mistake. Take it from someone who did it by accident once, hit the entry key by accident. Um, it wasn't a good day. I'm glad I had a backup from the night before. All right. The select statement. It's used to retrieve data. And, you know, I used to have the dog, the much wow dog, the, the Sheba. If you don't know the meme, you're, you're younger than I am or you haven't been on the internet as much as I have. Um, there's insane amounts of syntax for the select statement. So much so I'm going to spend the next three weeks on it. And I will scratch maybe 40% of it. The SQL statement is massive, the select statement. It is the bread and butter of the database world. The insert statement you use once in a while, the update statement you use once in a while, the select statement you use all the time. Putting stuff in is one thing. Looking at what's inside. Um, how many of you have done groceries recently? Okay. All right. And you put the groceries in the fridge, right? How many times did you put the groceries in the fridge? How many times have you walked past the fridge, opened the fridge door, and go, I wonder what's in here today? Depending on your age, lots. I swear to God, I watch my daughter at least once every 20 minutes walks past the fridge going, did that change? No, it hasn't changed the last time you looked. I haven't done groceries in five days. It hasn't changed. It's only getting less and less. So, you know, that's what I like to compare. The, the insert statement, too, is you add stuff to the fridge. Modify is you've got to create a yogurt and you ripped one off. You're taking it out. Delete is you realize that lettuce is now dripping because it's now rotten, and you're throwing it out. In the meantime, the select statement is every time you open up the fridge to see what else has changed in there. Or you need to grab another glass of milk, or you want another chunk of cheese, or you know, you want to rate it for whatever. You want to eat some celery because you're trying to be healthy. Then you put peanut butter on top. That you got out of the cupboard, which you looked at many times also. You know, but these are the examples of how these different parts of the language work. Select star from test is the example. This is I'm going to explain what the asterisk means in a bit. Um, but this is the simplest lang a version of a select statement you're ever going to get. There's no predicates, there's no where clause, there's no aggregates, there's no grouping, there's no ordering, there's no column selection. Just It's saying, give me everything from test. That's which is what asterisk means. It means give me all columns. List, give me everything you've got. Okay, so that's the end of the slideshow. So, like I said earlier, I am now going into demo mode. So I'm going to cover basically what I had on the slides, minus the history lesson, obviously. Step by step, I'm going to do each of the commands and show you guys what the implications are of everything. So the first command is create table. I'm going to call my table example, because I can. Now. Like any kind of programming, you should get into the habit of closing your brackets immediately. If you're using a language, that, I mean an editor that closes the brackets for you, congratulations. They're closing your brackets for you. You're going to get lazy. And the day you need, you're going to be able to use your, SQ, your editor, you're going to start hurting because you're going to forget to close your brackets. Um, good news is this isn't going to autocomplete for you. So you're going to have to open and close your brackets. The second you open a bracket, close it right away so you don't miss your closing bracket. My first column is going to be called ID. I'm going to make it a serial because I don't need a big serial. And I'm going to make it my primary key. As you've noticed, I'm writing everything lowercase. SQL doesn't care, just so you know. But you can make everything uppercase. And for those of you that are wondering what the keystroke is I did in this, it's Control F, no, Control Shift F. That's a specific to this editor. 
It's a bit like the uh, whatever it is in um, Eclipse to reformat your code, but for SQL. Yeah, I saw a hand. No, you have to use the words. You have to use all the words. It likes words. A little less chatting. A little more focusing on Dan. So we can get out of here. Again, I'm going to create a name column. Now, you'll notice that it went and bolded the word name. Because Postgres is kind of funny that way. There's an actual data type called name. And normally I tell you stay away from keywords. The, the thing is that you can never use the data type called name. You're not allowed to ever use it. So I don't know why he treats it as a special character, as a special word. So name is safe. It's the only one that is safe. Um, so name. I'm going to create this as a varcar 50. I'm going to force it to be not null. And then earlier, the example I had active. It was a Boolean. It was also, as you notice, it didn't underline the Boolean. But if I type it out completely, it will. It does, you can write it as bool or as boolean. It, they both work. Not null, default, true. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so here's my command. Now, I am going to purposefully make a mistake. I'm going to miss a comma. As you notice, each of the columns is comma delimited. I'm going to take out a comma just so you can see their error messages because error messages are important. It says syntax error at or near active. SQL usually tells you, gives you the word right after you made a mistake. It doesn't know exactly where you made the mistake. All it knows is it got to the word active and it goes, shit not working no more. Go look what happened before this. So that's one common mistake is you've missed a comma. So if you see something that looks like this, that means somewhere above there you missed a comma. Or another thing you might not you might have made another mistake you might have made. You forgot to give it a data type. You notice it's the same error message. Syntax error at or near not. Well, maybe the problem happened right before not. And now I'm going to run it. And if you're lucky, it's going to see show you what happened here. Query was OK. Zero rows, rows were affected. It took 172 milliseconds. Faster than you can blink. So I've created a table. There's stuff in there. There's nothing in there, I should say. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab, and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy-paste all my commands. So then I'll have a log for you guys. So if I go select star from example. Oh, one thing I want to highlight. I've already had one person saying, well, I did the commands, but it's not showing up on this side. Notice I created a table, but it's nothing show up in table. Refresh it. And then it'll show. You'll see my table that I just created right here. If you don't see it here, hit refresh, and then it usually will show up. Right click, refresh, wherever that was. Right click, refresh, schema, or you can hit F5, and it works. So I'm going to select star from example. That's, you know, the most basic SQL statement. And in this application, it gives you, like, it looks like a table, and you can see it's empty. No data display. It'll say there's an empty set. It took zero milliseconds to execute. Total time, 110 milliseconds. So it took it 110 milliseconds to take your command, receive it, decide what to do with it, run it, see what happened, and give you the results. Obviously, the more data you have, the longer that's going to take. So I'm going to add a couple of rows of data. Be one of those days. Okay, so I'm going to insert into example. 
So here's the two columns. I wish it wouldn't uppercase the word name. Active, and then two values. And I do have an error in here on purpose. I actually did that on purpose so that I can re-execute because I'm going to show you guys the various errors you're going to get at this point. Before you see it working, I'm going to do all the same things you guys are going to do. I'm going to hit execute. It's going to go unterminated quote string. Anybody want to take a guess at what unterminated quote means? You don't have a matching quote. So basically put you have one quote but no two quote, not a second quote. The other thing I'm going to do is this, the other common one. <coughs> All right. Insert has more target columns and expressions. <coughs> I'm basically, I told it I'm inserting into these two columns, but I only gave it one value. If you're putting into two things, you've got to give it two things. It's not psychic. It doesn't know what you're trying to say. It's not your significant other that you're assuming that knows what you want. It doesn't know. Another mistake people will do is this. I forgot the comma. Now all it's saying is syntax error at or near active. Okay, it doesn't know exactly what's wrong, but it knows something's wrong. Therefore, it's telling you, go look here. And the last common mistake, actually there's two more. In, uh, yeah, that actually should be true, not active. Duh. Insert has more expressions than target columns. Earlier I did more columns, not enough values. This time you gave it too many values, not enough columns. Same problem. You give it too much information, it doesn't know what to do with it because you're not telling it what to do with it. And the last one I'm going to cover, the last mistake I'm going to cover, is not quoting my string. I'm going to hit execute. It says column Dan does not exist. Postgres knows this is a word. It knows it's not a number. It knows it's a word. It's going, what am I supposed to do with this? Since they didn't take the time to put quotes around it, I'm assuming it's a database object. So let's go look for a column called Dan. And it's going to say it does not exist. In actual fact, I got one more. Which magically worked. Normally it doesn't. Damn. It used to not work. Um, I guess the version of Postgres I've got on here is being a little more forgiving. By the way, you shouldn't do that. Um, don't feed... If you're going to feed a number into a string table, a string column, quote the number. Um, because you're forcing it to... You're coercing the data. Um, I actually cover that later in the term, coercing the data, but basically put your force in the database server to do something it doesn't want to do. That's why it's called coercing. You're basically taking it, you're taking something that it's not expecting, it looks at it as, oh, by the way, I guess it needs to be this, so the end user's a, the guy who wrote this command is an idiot, so I'll fix it for them. Don't make the database server think any harder than it, harder than it needs to. And don't use double quotes because it's going to complain about that too. Single quotes. All right, so I'm going to run this, and I'm going to run it, and run it, and run it, and run it. As you can see, I'm keep inserting the same stuff, and it's doing what it needs to do. So now I've added a bunch of data, and it's all identical. Here we go. I got 16 rows identical. Yes, they both raised their hands at the same time. That's, that was kind of cute. Uh, if you want to insert more than one row, there's two ways of doing it. Um, one is... doing this. So you end up listing them um, value, comma, value set, comma, value set, value, can you call it value set? Not, doesn't work everywhere. 
I tend to recommend that you do them as separate insert statements. So if there's, let's say you're doing 50 values, and it tells you, hey, you got a mistake somewhere in here. You're not going to know where it is. On the other hand, if you have a mistake here, see, it'll do the first two and then tell you that one's wrong. So it gives you a better chance to figure it out. So those are the two ways of doing inserts. I recommend distinct insert statements. Because the other one's prone to mistakes. You can make mistakes with it. <coughs> Again, I'm going to look at, see what's inside now. Now I'm up to 22 rows. All right, I got lots for my, for my examples. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to alter my table. I'm going to add a column. So I'm going to alter my table, and I even forgot to give the name of the table. I'm going to add a column. I'm going to call this one email, like such. And as you can see, it looks almost like when you create a, create a table where you're specifying the column and the data type. If you want, you can set up the not null here, which is probably a bad idea at this point because there's values already in the table. We're going to get a weird error. Um, you can set the default value. And here, you know, you can give it a default value. That's fine. But for now, I'll leave it like that. And I'm going to execute it. And it says, hey, it worked. So let's go. And execute that again. Now you'll see there's the email and it shows that it's full of null values. That's not a string null. That's this editor showing you that it's null. Otherwise, you wouldn't know it's empty. If it was empty, then it wouldn't, even if it was an empty string, an empty string is not the same thing as null. An empty string is an empty string. A null is an absence of value. Empty is still a value when you think about it. Just because you have nothing inside your head doesn't mean there's a, a void inside your head. There's just nothing there. There's a difference. So now I'm going to go update example, set email and I'm going to run this. Now remember earlier I warned you don't do this without a where statement. I'm going to do it without the where statement just to show you what happens. 22 rows affected. And that took all of 700 milliseconds. In actual fact, if this was running on a real server, it would have been a lot faster than that. Um, you know, 500 milliseconds. Just depends what my laptop's doing right now. So if I were to go. I can see everything's set to Bob. It's great. Um, now I'm going to go fix one of these. I'm going to go fix the first one because he doesn't have a proper name. Update table example set name equal to Frank. And I'm going to modify their email address while I'm at it so you can see the two columns being changed at once. Now, if I were to run this without the where clause, everybody would be frank. And now their email would be frank at email.com. I already showed you guys what happens when you do that, so I'm going to avoid that. Now, um, this is a where clause. The where clause is a series of, of Boolean expressions known as predicates. Picture this as the if statement. You guys learn about if statements yet in Java? Yes, no, maybe. Some of you have already seen an if statement. What week is this? <laughs> we don't know. So 
I'm going to modify that first record so that name and everything where ID is equal to 1. I'm going to hit execute. And update table. Oh, what am I doing? Dan's on crack. It's update example. Considering I just did it and I did it right the first time. So update example. I've got, I've got my DDL and my DML mixed up in my head at the moment. Update example, set name to Frank, where email is equal to this and ID is equal to 1. One row affected, 63 milliseconds. So I'm going to grab this, put it over here, paste it, because, you know. And now I'm going to select everything from here. Now, something that throws a lot of students off, and I know the text is really small. It's unfortunate. You'll notice that that number one is now at the bottom. This is a Postgres thing. Not all database servers do this, just so you know. So whenever you modify rows, they get written at the end of the table. Because Postgres uses a conservative write method. And what does that mean? What it does, it goes, I'm going to modify the row with the ID of 1. I'm going to mark that one as potentially deleted. Then it adds the value to the table. If it successfully adds it to the table, then it deletes the old version of the record. So it actually versions the data as it goes. So that means if you're updating the data, you're actually creating a new copy of the row at the end of the table. That's why it's at the end of the table. It's actually take, it's as if you were going to change your notes. Instead of erasing it, you wrote out the entire note, and then you erase the line above it. That's an internal thing that you guys don't need to worry about. It's just I'd like to, I like to highlight that so that when people are doing their labs and their assignments, they're like, Where'd my data go? It's at the end. Every time you change it, it's at the end. That's all. Pardon? Yeah, there's ways of passing data from one to another. Yes, there's a lot of different versions. I don't cover some of the more esoteric versions of this because not all servers support for update. Go figure. So I, what I've tried to teach is the what they call the ANSI standard SQL, which means the most common features you'll find in most servers. And then if you want to learn about that extra stuff, that's what the internet's for. Yes? There is a difference. It does, it does make a difference when you're writing queries against it. Null has special meaning. It means that a value is never given. Well, we will often use null, just so I'm talking to that side of the room too, not just this side of the room. We'll use null as a way to identify that there is no value. There's no known value. An empty string is a value. A null is the absence of value. So when you don't know what's supposed to be there, you use a null. If you know it's supposed to be empty, that's okay. Then you put an empty string. By the way, numbers are never null because they're zero. All right, so I did a single update. I did a multi-group update. Now I am going to show the delete. So I'm going to delete from example where the ID is equal to 2. I'm going to hit execute. Boop. One row affected. Notice it took a little longer because it actually needed to write the change. If I go and now do a select, you'll see that 2 is gone at the top. Just gone. 2 never existed. Figment of your imagination. As far as database is concerned, nothing's ever happened. In actual fact, I want to grab that command so I can paste it to the log. Now, I'm going to alter my table again. I'm going to drop the column email. Do you notice I don't need to specify the data type? 
What this is going to do is going to take that column, which we all know has a bunch of email addresses in it, and it's going to convince the database server that they're, they're not there. Now you'll see, query OK, zero rows affected. You're not affecting the rows, you're affecting the table. So I'm going to take this, put it in here, come back over here. The column is gone. The data is gone. If you noticed, it never said a word about whether or not you're sure you want to do this. It's gone. So now I'm going to do my insert statement. So I got a bunch of rows in here, um, a bunch of rows. Actually, you know what? Well, that's not going to work because I forgot my semicolon. I want lots of rows. Okay, so now if I go, so I got 139 rows. That's not even enough, but that will pretend it is. So if I go without a where clause, and I hit execute, so that's 140 rows of data. Well then. How long did that take? Zero milliseconds. Oh, it's gone. 139 rows affected. It took less than a millisecond. Yeah, no, I'm deleting what was left in there. So I'm deleting just the uh, everything that was in there. Yeah, delete us for a row, alter, uh, alter drop was drop the column, yeah. The structure is still there. So if I go, so I'm going to put in, um, a bunch of rows again, lots of rows. Gonna wait for it to finish running. Oh, did it finish? Okay. Let's do it again. I just want lots of rows. Almost done. All right, so two hundred and ninety-eight rows. Here's truncate. Truncate took a little longer. And some people will say, well, why would it take a little longer than the delete? Uh, it's because truncate actually rewrites part of the table structure. So it basically creates the table and says, by the way, this is now empty. Whereas the other one deleted row by row. Now, if I was dealing with a million rows, it would go the other way around. Where a million rows would take longer to delete, but the truncate would be faster. Because 78 milliseconds is nothing when you're dealing 200 rows. If you're dealing with 2 million rows, that could take you know a couple of seconds to delete. And you end up with, whereas the truncate will always take 78 seconds, milliseconds, roughly, give or take. So there is no difference between truncate and delete in this case, except you can't surgically select what you're going to truncate because it literally, it's gone. Now. I'm just going to put some rows in again, just for fun. OK, I'm still back to 298 rows. The last command. Three hundred forty-four milliseconds. That one took a little longer, 
Because it's not only nuking the data, it's also nuking the structure out of the database server, out of the catalog of the database server. And now if I were to go, actually I want to keep this one, put it in here. And if I want to go select star from example, example doesn't exist. Why? Because it's gone. I deleted it, I dropped it like a hot potato. It's on the floor, never to be seen again. So you've had an example of creating a table, adding a column, removing a column, adding some data, changing the data, deleting the data three different ways, and getting rid of the table. So that's basically the round trip of the basics of DDL and, and a bit of, you know, DML. Um, there's a few things that you can learn how to do, which is renaming a column. And that one there, the reason I don't usually cover it in class is because the syntax isn't the same server by server. MySQL syntax is slightly different than Postgres's syntax. So if you need to rename a column, Google is your friend. Actually, Google isn't everybody, anybody's friend right now. You know, DuckDuckGo is your friend. Um, so those ones will show, you can figure it out how to do it from there. Because like I said, the syntax is different from MySQL than Postgres. So I'd rather not um, poison your, your, your brains with specific syntax unless I have to. Um, and there's other things you can do. You can change the data type. You can change the default values. You can get rid of the default values. There's all kinds of things you can do uh, with it. But that is the essentials of this side of the deal.